welcome. We're going to uh, get into the Gospel of Luke again. This is the Bible study for January 31st. So this is the last one for this month. Uh, we'll be heading into February uh, next week. Uh, this year has started off fast, I believe. So we are in chapter 5. We're looking at a passage of scripture that is referred to as uh, the calling of the first disciples. And that's a, uh, a good description of what happens and what we read about. But I like to look at it as a little different. I like to look at it as Jesus goes fishing. So I've got my lucky fishing cap. I brought my rod and reel. I should have brought bait. So I'm not really ready to go fishing. But as we'll see, when Jesus goes fishing, it's not really fishing. You know, the old joke is uh, they call it fishing because you're not guaranteed to get a catch. If you were, it would be catching. And I think when Jesus goes fishing, it's a little more certain what's going to happen. So if you'll join me, we are in Luke chapter 5, and we're starting in verse uh, 4. Verse 4, the beginning of the, uh, of the uh, chapter. And what has happened up to this point is Jesus has been preaching to a crowd of people, uh, along the shores of the, uh, the Sea of, of uh, Galilee. And he's walking along, and then the crowd has gotten so large, they are pressing in upon him. He's having trouble uh, you know, standing and speaking. They want to hear, so they're getting closer. So he comes upon some fishermen. They've been out fishing all night. They're repairing their nets, putting away their gear for the day. Uh, you know, their day is ending. Their work day is ending. And Jesus comes up to them, and in chapter 4, uh, he is talking to the people. Uh, he asks the fisherman, who happens to be, you know, Simon. We know him as Simon Peter. Simon is one of the fishermen there. Jesus asks if he will put his boat out from shore a little bit and let Jesus stand in it and effectively use it as a pulpit and preach to the crowd. Uh, so, in four, chapter uh, 5, verse 4, we pick up, uh, When he had finished speaking, he said to Simon, Put out into deep water, and let down the nets for a catch. Simon answered, Master, we've worked hard all night, and haven't caught anything. But because you say so, I will let down the nets. So, if uh, we pick up here in this... Uh, uh, this passage, we see that Jesus has finished talking to the people, he's dismissed the crowds, he turns to the fishermen, turns to Simon, and gives him an unusual uh, suggestion, or an unusual request. He says, go out into the deep water, put down your nets for a catch. Now that's an interesting choice of words. Jesus doesn't say, try to fish over there, see if you'll get something. What he says is, go out there and get a catch. I'm not sure if Simon picked up on that. Uh, one of the things about this is, I don't think it's random. I don't think there's anything random going on here. Uh, Jesus, uh, most likely, is going to do what's going to happen next uh, so that it will lead to Simon's commitment to follow him. Simon had already met Jesus before. Jesus had come to his house, healed his mother-in-law of a fever. His brother Andrew had uh, heard Jesus, had seen Jesus, had told Simon about Jesus. So Jesus and Simon, uh, I guess as we'd say today, have a little bit of a history. Simon knows Jesus. And he has already had an invitation to follow Jesus. But where do we meet him here? Fishing on his boats with his crew of fishermen. So Jesus is going to have another moment here where he is going to call this man. And this is going to be a critical moment for Simon and really for the other fishermen that are working with him. So Jesus tells Simon after preaching to go out and drop his nets in the deep water for a catch. And Simon responds, Lord, I will do what you say. But we have already fished all night, and we have caught nothing. 
So Simon is obedient, but what do you think? Uh, if you had been Simon Peter, and when Jesus said this to you, what would you have done? We have some questions and some possible answers here that I found that I think are kind of interesting. I think they cover the spectrum. So, you're Simon Peter. You fished all night. You've caught nothing. And here Jesus says to you, go out a little deeper, go out into the deep water, put down the nets, and get a catch. Not try over there and see if you get uh, better luck this time, but go out there, put your nets down, get a catch. How would you have responded? What would you have thought if you're Simon Peter? Would you have wondered who this guy was? Would you have suggested to him that there might be a better time to go fishing? Uh, maybe when the fish were actually biting? Told Jesus that maybe he should stick to his preaching and leave the fishing to the professionals? Would you have grudgingly gone ahead with the idea? You know, here's a carpenter telling me a fisherman how to fish. I'll, I'll humor him. Or would you have happily done what Jesus requested? What would have been your response? Sort of try to put yourself in Simon Peter's position and see if you can sense how this event played out for him. So, if we pick up in verse 6, now when they had done so, uh, they had done what Jesus said, they caught such a large number of fish that their nets began to break. So they signaled to their partners in the other boat to come and help them. And they came and they filled both boats uh, so full that they both began to sink. Now imagine that. I think one of the problems with Bible study sometimes is, especially if you have been in the church any length of time, you get kind of used to these stories and you sort of know what's going to happen. And so the impact isn't as great uh, for us sometimes as it would have been for the people living through these events. And I think sometimes that is uh, to our detriment that we don't really sense the amazement that these people would have experienced. So let's think about it. Uh, what is going on here? Uh, when this happens, the nets are breaking, the boats are sinking, you're Peter. How would he have felt? How would you have felt? Here are some possibilities. You see what's going on before you. You're experiencing it for the first time. And Peter, would you have felt overjoyed? Dumbfounded? Like, what is going on? Terrible what you'd said earlier or thought about Jesus and his uh, request? Would you have been aware of who Jesus was? Uh, it is interesting because Simon had heard Jesus preach. He had heard what he had to say, how he taught, how it was different from how others taught. He had seen Jesus perform miracles. He had seen his own mother-in-law healed by Jesus. But this incident seems to affect him more than any of those other things. Maybe because he was a fisherman. Maybe he understood more fully than most just what's going on here. Because what's going on here, I think, Peter recognized, was divine. It came from God. Uh, this harvest of fish just could not be explained in natural terms. Peter was an experienced fisherman. He worked with other fishermen. He knew the lake. He knew the Sea of Galilee, what it was like. He knew how the fish that lived there behaved. He knew when to fish for them, when not to fish for them, how to fish for them. And what he sees here is something that cannot be explained, that had to come from God. And his response is interesting. In verse 8, when Simon Peter saw all this, he fell at Jesus' feet and said, Go away from me, Lord. I am a sinful man. For he and all his companions were astonished at the catch of fish they had taken. And so were James and John, the sons of Zebedee, Simon's partners. Then Jesus said to Simon, Don't be afraid. From now on, you will fish for people. So they pulled their boats up on shore, they left everything, and followed him. 
Now our commentator, uh, uh, today's commentary says, you know, Simon's recognition that he was a sinful man was in response to this miracle that he had witnessed. And what Jesus is doing here with Simon is giving him a change in identity and a transformation of purpose. Not a fisherman who goes after fish, but someone who fishes for people. That's Simon's new calling from Jesus. I think it's significant the response that Simon makes here. And when we hear he was astonished, uh, we sort of throw words like that around somewhat casually these days, but you know it means exactly what it says. He was filled with astonishment. Uh, what happened was beyond what he could understand. And he realizes he is in the presence of someone who is divine, someone who is from God. And he realizes his sinfulness, his failures, his failings, the fact that he is not the person that he needs to be. Uh, but if you are a fisherman, again, try to put yourself in the position of these men experiencing this. What would this decision to just leave everything, leave their boats, leave their nets, everything that they have worked so hard for, their jobs, their professions, as professional fishermen, leave it, leave it all. How does that strike you? If you were another fisherman along the shores of the Sea of Galilee and you saw what happened, what would you have thought about these men and their reaction? Uh, would you have thought it was silly? You know, silly to give up a respectable career? For what? Who knows what? And as we're going to see, it may not have been everything they expected. Uh, would you have thought it was exciting? And maybe even fun? To try something new? You know, a new experience? A new uh, possibility in your life? Would it have took a lot more than that to get you to change careers? You know, a miraculous haul of fish? Eh, I, I, needs more than that. You know, sometimes we have amazing things happen and we're unmoved by them. Would you have felt like following Jesus might just be more important than any career you might have? Maybe. Maybe not. Our responses sometimes to the same events can vary a great deal. But we see what Peter does. He leaves his boats. He leaves his career as a fisherman to follow Jesus. It's interesting to think that right here, Jesus has found the three men that will become his inner circle. If you think of the disciples, the twelve uh, disciples, uh, of that group there are three that stand out. Peter, James, John. And they're right here in these boats watching this. Uh, it seems that this event was a significant event in these men's lives that led them to decide to follow Jesus. Um, one commentator said that there may be as many as seven of those twelve disciples who were fishermen along this uh, little coast, along the Sea of Galilee. Uh, maybe as many as seven. We know that Andrew was Peter's brother. He was a uh, disciple. So we have four here uh, who might have been present at this event. Maybe more. Uh, but they weren't all fishermen. And uh, Jesus called some interesting people to be his disciples as we will see next. So, what the uh, Bible here titles the calling of Levi. Now, who is Levi? Well, that would be who we know as Matthew. Uh, it's interesting. Jesus is calling these men, Peter, James, John, and Matthew. We, we read about their calling in this chapter. And these men, think about what they did. Uh, Peter, of course, preached at Pentecost, became 
probably the primary leader of the early church, uh, was martyred in Rome years later. Uh, and when we see the Gospel of Mark, we generally recognize Mark as being a follower, a close follower of Peter. So what you have in the Gospel of Mark is, according to some folks at least, probably could easily be titled the Gospel of Peter. The information in it came from Peter. The Gospel of Matthew is written by Matthew, who we're about to, to read about. And of course, Matthew uh, wrote that Gospel. We have his account of uh, the ministry of Jesus. Tradition in the church says he went east and ended up bringing the gospel to India. There is a church in India today that traces its origins not back to the missionaries but back to Matthew. Uh, and the tradition is he was martyred in India for his testimony about Jesus. James was the very first disciple to be martyred for his faith. And also a significant leader in the early church. And then there's John. Wrote the Gospel of John. Wrote the book of Revelation. Uh, church tradition is he outlived all the other uh, disciples and uh, became one of the leaders in the church in Ephesus right before his, uh, his final death. Uh, a significant individual in the history of the early church. All these men played a, a tremendous role in the early church, its history, its development, the scriptures we have today. So, not insignificant events here. Was Jesus just randomly walking along the shore, found some fishermen, uh, did this? No, I don't think so. I think he sought these men out on purpose. And he went after somebody else. Jesus is fishing. I think, not for fish. But I think Jesus is fishing for followers right here. Men he can use to lead his church after he returns to heaven. In verse 27, we have uh, the calling of Levi, or Matthew. And we meet Matthew, or Levi, in his daily work. He's working. Levi is at work. And then Jesus comes to meet him. Interesting passage compared to what we just read. Uh, verse 27. After this. Now after this is not the calling of Peter, James, and John. Uh, it's the intervening verses in uh, the chapter. And in those verses, Jesus has healed a leper. He's healed a paralytic. Uh, so some events have happened in between uh, these two callings of disciples in chapter 5 of Luke. But after those things that happened, Jesus went out and he saw a tax collector by the name of Levi sitting at his tax booth. He is at work. It's not work that's very popular. Fishermen may have been accepted in the community, not so much tax collectors. A couple of reasons they were despised by a lot of people. Uh, they worked for the Romans. The Romans were the pagan occupiers. They were not Jews. And they controlled the land. And they taxed the land. And Levi's working for them. Not something that's going to get him very popular among his people. And maybe the other thing that would have really stuck with people is um, a lot of times... Uh, Tax collectors charged people more than the taxes were, and they sort of pocketed the difference. They skimmed off the top, if you will. So the Romans taxed at a certain level, and the tax collectors taxed a little higher than that, and they kept the difference. That's how they made their money, and some tax collectors got very well off from doing this. If you can imagine every time people pay taxes, uh, part of it goes to the tax collector, they got pretty wealthy in some cases. So they were not well liked. Um, it would have made Levi a sinner. Just a blanket term of someone who is not uh, following the law, who is not doing right, a sinner. So he was a sinner in the eyes of many. Um, so if you're the other disciples, we've just seen a few of them called. They have not been following Jesus long. How would you have felt if you were Peter, 
James, John, that Jesus is going to call a tax collector to be one of his disciples? Does that sound right? A sinner? Think about it. Jesus is going to call a sinner, a publicly identified, undesirable person, a sinner. Someone who collaborates with the Romans. Someone who robs people. He's going to call somebody like that to be a disciple? Well, that's what he does. Jesus walks up to this tax collector by the name of Levi, sitting in his tax booth, and he says, follow me. Jesus said to him, follow me. No miracles, no preaching, just follow me. And Levi got up, left everything, and followed him. Sometimes we can read through these verses too fast, but here's one we should pause at and think about the implications. You're at work, somebody walks in, they look at you, and they say, follow me. How likely are you to get up and leave everything and follow them? We're told that's what Levi did. And this was not a necessarily easy decision. Imagine. He has a relatively secure job with the Romans, a relatively comfortable life. People despise it, but he has money. And for some people, that's pretty much it right there, right? Money is the thing. If you've got it, great. If you don't, that's terrible. Jesus calls him to follow him. And Matthew responds. Uh, I think that when Jesus walked up to him, Jesus is looking at him. And Levi, I think, sees Jesus coming, and he's looking at him. Uh, I don't think there was anybody in Capernaum who would not have known about Jesus. Uh, the word about what he was doing, how he was preaching, spread all around there, just like with the fishermen who knew who Jesus was, I think Levi knew who Jesus was and knew what Jesus was saying. And something about that made him respond to Jesus' invitation. And when he responded, he's going to join a group of men who might not have liked him very much because of his profession as a tax collector. They're all fishermen, right? What do fishermen do with tax collectors? Probably grumble when they have to pay tax. And he's now asking this tax collector to join his fishermen and become his followers. So there could have been some tension there, I think likely. Moreover, how easy is it to quit your job with the Romans? I don't know that it's a simple thing to just you know, go in the next day and say, uh, about this job I've got with you guys, uh, Sorry, I got to leave. Something else has come up. Would the Romans just go, oh, okay, no problem? I don't know. Uh, you know, we work in North Carolina. It's a right-to-work state. You can have the right to leave any time you want. Uh, your employer has a right to let you go any time they decide to. That's not always the case, though. Some people work under a contract, you know. Uh, each uh, party has certain things spelled out that they can and cannot do. Uh, some people have committed to a contract working a year, and they can't just in the middle of the year go, ah, oh, sorry, this, you know, I've got to do something else. I don't know how easy it was for Levi, for Matthew to just leave his job, but he does. Uh, he makes it work out. Uh, there is a cost to following Jesus, and we should never be uh, uh, afraid to mention that. It's not easy. It's not simple. It wasn't for Levi, and it won't be for us. However, Levi does something very interesting. Was he committed to Jesus? I think the next few verses tell us the answer to that. Uh, Levi held a great banquet for Jesus at his house. He throws a party for Jesus. Sounds good. Uh, and a large number or a large crowd of tax collectors and others were eating with him. So Levi 
throws a party for Jesus. He's excited, obviously, about what he has done. And he invites people he knows. Who is a tax collector going to know? Other tax collectors, right? No one else will associate with him. So he invites tax collectors. Come, meet Jesus. And for some of them, it might have been the first time they'd had that opportunity. And others, I don't know who these others were, but they were people that would have associated with tax collectors. And in the eyes of others in the community, that might have made them a little questionable too. You know, uh, it's bad to be a tax collector, but associating with tax you know, associating with one, eh, maybe that's not much better. So anyway, uh, Jesus is there, his disciples are there, Levi's there, tax collectors and other people are there, but the Pharisees and the teachers of the law who belonged to their sect, complained to Jesus' disciples. Why do you eat and drink with tax collectors and sinners? Who? Now the Pharisees, they get a lot of bad uh, press in the New Testament. Uh, but they were a group of people who tried to obey uh, the Mosaic Law, to try to keep the law to the best of their ability. Uh, many of the things they taught were not that different from the things Jesus taught. So what's the problem with these people? Uh, well, here we see, I think, their problem. They are looking at the tax collectors and these other people that are there, and they see sinners. In contrast to who? To themselves who are trying very hard not to be sinners. And to them, the best thing you can do is not associate with these kinds of people. These kinds of people are not people you associate with. Um, they would have looked at it this way. Jesus and his followers, they could not be true men of God if they associated with people like this. If Jesus is the Messiah, then he must be a man of God. And if he's a man of God, he would know the kinds of people he's associating with, and he would not associate with them. He would not associate with sinners. These people were what I think today we would refer to as self-righteous. They looked at others and saw the sin in their lives, in their own lives, they didn't see it. And Jesus replies to them. Uh, Jesus answered them this way. It is not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. The people like Levi who saw their need, who realized they needed what they didn't have, and that was a relationship with God, they responded to Jesus. Now these men who thought they had a relationship with God did not. Their pride, their self-righteousness prevented them from responding to Jesus the way they should. Because they're all sinners. We're all sinners. The Pharisees were sinners too. But they didn't re realize that. They didn't recognize that. They thought they were okay. They had a right relationship with God. In order to respond to Jesus, we have to understand our need. Uh, we have to acknowledge uh, our guilt. We have to accept that we are sinners. We have to accept that we're sinners before we can renounce our sins, before we can change, before we can repent and come to Jesus. Uh, he's looking for people who are humble and see their need. And it's interesting here, uh, what connects Levi, this tax collector, to Simon, this fisherman? When Jesus performs a miracle that can't be explained in front of Simon, He recognizes he's a sinner. 
Lord, you should not be around me. I'm a sinner. It's a little bit of the thinking of the Pharisees. Lord, I'm a sinner. You shouldn't be here around me. You, you should remove yourself from me. You, you, you don't need to associate with someone like me. That's Simon's reply to Jesus' miracle. When Levi's called by Jesus to follow him, he's overcome with joy. He throws a party. He invites his friends to meet Jesus. Because I'm sure he never would have thought that such a thing could be possible. To Levi, the miracle was Jesus' request, his invitation, to follow him. Jesus' acceptance of him was a miracle to Levi. He didn't need to see fish uh, popping up out of the water. That was a miracle enough for him to follow Jesus. Both of these men understood their need. They saw themselves as sinners. They recognized they needed help. They needed a relationship with God, and they needed someone to bridge that gap between them and where they were and God. And that was, of course, Jesus. That's what he does for us. He is our Savior. These men knew they needed a Savior. And Jesus looks to them and says, Hey, I can help you. These men are sick and need a physician, and I'm a physician. I can help them. The Pharisees, we're okay. We're all right. You know, we're doing just fine. We're keeping the law. We're staying away from sinners. You know, we, we do not need uh, anything else. And Jesus says, you guys, I cannot help until you are willing to humble yourselves and come to me as sinners in need of saving. I can't help you. Uh, a doctor can't help healthy people. Of course, we don't always realize when we're sick, do we? One of the questions at the end of the lesson was, I wanted to think about, I think, who is more difficult to deal with? Sinners, like the tax collector, his friends, or the self-righteous, like the Pharisees? Who's harder to deal with? Who are we most like? The tax collectors, the fishermen, the Pharisees. When we come to church on Sunday, how are we on Monday? Because if we're truly following Jesus, there shouldn't be much difference, should there? Thanks for joining me today. It's a pretty quick passage. I think the th challenge for us is to stop and think about it and what it was like for these men, these people that we encounter here. It's very easy to go from verse 27 to verse 28 to verse 29, but there's a lot going on there. There's a lot that happens there. A lot's implied. How easy is it for us to say, I'll turn my back on the life I know, on the job I have, to follow Jesus? How many of us are able and willing to take Jesus where we are, to the people we know, to the folks we encounter? Very easy to go to church well. Normally it's very easy to go to church. Maybe not right now. But going to church is one thing. But taking Jesus to where we are the rest of the week, maybe that's the challenge that Levi seemed to get. He gets it. He does it. Sometimes we don't. We're too much like the Pharisees. At any rate, I hope the lesson was meaningful for you. I hope it was helpful, and maybe you learned something. Or looked at it in a different way. Jesus is fishing, but not for fish. You know, he didn't need a lucky cap to go fishing. He wasn't fishing for fish. He's fishing for people in need of a Savior. I think he still is. 
you pray with me? Dear Lord, we just ask you to help us to keep in mind what you're doing and help us to align what we're doing with what you're doing. Lord, help us to have a heart that's open to those around us and their needs. Help us not to be self-righteous. Help us to be humble. Help us to be seeking you and those we can help by pointing them to you. Pray, Lord, for everyone today to have a good uh, day, a good week. People will be safe. You'll keep them well. And, Lord, we just pray for wisdom to do what you want us to do at this time in this place where we are. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you all and have a great day.